On November 17, 1986, a Japanese airline's Boeing 747 left Paris headed for Tokyo. While flying over Alaska, Captain Kenju Terauchi noticed strange lights moving in front of his aircraft. The unidentified object suddenly headed towards the aircraft. Uh, Japan Air The flight captain first thought was a fighter jet turned out to be a round craft twice the size of a jumbo jet the incident still remains unclassified on june 24th 1947 kenneth arnold an american pilot saw nine unidentified objects about mount rainier washington Convinced that these objects were Russian in nature and fearing an invasion, Arnold reported the incident to the local FBI office. In December of that year, faced with a growing number of sightings, the Air Force was officially mandated to investigate these mysterious flying saucers. But the military weren't the only ones recruited. The idea of an invasion also worried security agencies. John Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, and Admiral Roscoe Hillencoter, director of the recently created CIA, quickly became interested in the sightings as well. However, the public was not to discover their real role in the UFO matter until 30 years later, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act. For many years, uh, it was the contention of uh, all government offices in the United States that the sole investigator of UFOs was the Air Force. Uh, we now know this is absolutely untrue. Uh, we know that UFO reports were distributed throughout the United States military, all of the branches, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy. Uh, there were Marine Corps sightings. The, the CIA initiated an interest in UFOs as early as 1948, uh, a very strong interest uh, covering worldwide sightings, um, and uh, collected, in fact, some very, very good reports. We also know that the FBI collected many uh, UFO reports, not just in 1947, but beyond that. Other uh, government agencies, such as the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, there were, there were my goodness, uh, emergency UFO reports that went to the White House at various times. So that uh, none of this was known until the era in the United States of the Freedom of Information Act, which really, um, the Freedom of Information Act became effective uh, in practice after 1974. You might call the first 10 years of the Freedom of Information Act a kind of glory age in which it was relatively, relatively easy uh, for UFO researchers to get some good documents out of the government. In particular, I think under Jimmy Carter, uh, President Carter in the late 70s, who uh, seems to have encouraged a somewhat liberal interpretation of the Freedom of Information Act, which meant basically that it would not be overly expensive for people to request such documents, uh, and that government agencies would, be, would have to respond quickly. Uh, by the mid-1980s, this was really no longer the case. But for a good 10 years uh, in the United States, uh, UFO researchers were able to get thousands upon thousands of documents from the CIA, the FBI, the DIA, Navy, Army, Air Force, and elsewhere pertaining to UFOs. National Security Agency, the NSA, sometimes known as no such agency, uh, had a uh, appears to have had a very strong interest in UFOs. We have one NSA UFO report going back to 1953, a few months after the agency was founded, uh, despite the fact that the NSA had maintained that they had absolutely no interest in UFOs at all. So uh, we now know that this, none of this was the case. Well, in the 1970s, the United States government released, under provisions of the Freedom of Information Act, thousands of pages of documents relating to UFO reports and to the subject in general from agencies such as the FBI, CIA, and later many other agencies um, produced reports. Interestingly, this was after years of denial that they had any such reports. However, many documents remain classified at 
what amounts to an above top secret level and even many top secret documents are still being withheld in the interests of national security and that information is not guesswork that that is actually stated within the context of the security classifications in the documents that have been released but it's quite clear that uh, there's still a lot being withheld in my opinion and I think the most sensitive material is not contained in any document. I think if you talk to anybody in the intelligence community, they'll tell you that the most sensitive information is not written down on the United States government memoranda. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot to be, uh, there's still a lot being withheld. But what has been released quite clearly evinces evidence, if not proof, of serious government involvement and the, the delicate delicacy of classification. I mean, there's an, there's an FBI document going back to 1949 which says that uh, the subject matter of flying disks, flying sources, unidentified objects and so forth is considered top secret by a number of the military agencies such as the United States Air Force, Army and Navy. So e that information alone is very, very important. National Security Agency was taken to the Supreme Court in 1982 to disclose the reasons why they were withholding a certain amount of documents and uh, they gave their reasons for withholding the documents in a 21 page above top secret affidavit which was classified top secret umbra and I should mention right now top secret means information the unauthorized disclosure of which can reasonably be expected to cause exceptionally grave damage to the security so already we're talking about sensitive material but the fact that material about UFOs is being classified at an above top secret, I think, tells the whole story. As it happens, I've spoken to somebody who has seen that 21 page above top secret affidavit. And I don't know the details, but I know that, that the gist of it is that it doesn't talk about recovered alien bodies, United States government contact with aliens and everything. If there's any information like that, it's unlikely to be on any any documents which are shown even even in the United States Supreme Court. Release documents reveal that the CIA initially believed that the UFO phenomenon was simply a rumor spread by subversives. In July 1952, an incident occurred that seemed to support their theory. On July 19 and 26, unidentified objects were detected on radar screens at the National Airport in Washington DC. These objects were flying around the White House and the Pentagon, where airspace was restricted at all times. F-94 fighter jets were dispatched, but they never caught up with the speedy objects. While the situation was getting out of control in the air, on the ground, telephone switchboards in the nation's capital were literally paralyzed by calls from concerned citizens, an unexpected turn of events which threatened public safety. A press conference was held on July 27, and the only explanation put forth by the Air Force was temperature inversions. To the CIA, it was beginning to look as if they had a national crisis on their hands. If enemies of the state had wanted to paralyze the country's emergency response teams, they couldn't have found a better way to do it. The CIA demanded a meeting to discuss the flying saucer problem. This meeting took place in January 1953 and was known as the Robertson Panel. Its conclusions had a major impact on the future of UFO investigations. The Robertson Panel is one of the most uh, important turning points in the history of the American study of UFOs. Most people don't really appreciate the significance of it. In 1952, the UFO wave in the United States reached an absolute peak in terms of the quality and the quantity of what was being seen. As a result of that, the U.S. Air Force held a major press conference in July 52 that said, no, no, it's all temperature and weather phenomena. In the public matter, in the public domain, that laid the matter to rest. But in the classified world, I think people understood that this was not a true explanation. Now, the Harry Truman presidency was ending in January of 1953. Very hastily, a panel of uh, Nobel and Nobel caliber scientists was assembled by the CIA to do a classified study of UFOs. This became known as the Robertson Panel after H.P. Robertson who led it. Uh, we now know that the Robertson Panel conclusions were written before the panel convened. 
And in fact, this panel convened during the very final weekend of the Truman presidency. Rather significant. Uh, what the panel said uh, was that UFOs were uh, not a matter of national security. They did not represent any alien technology. Um, and that furthermore, it, was, it would be important for the American government to debunk and educate the public on the true nature of UFOs, which was that they were all explainable natural phenomena. Following the Robertson panel, it seemed that the FBI, the CIA, and even the NSA, the National Security Agency, took an avid interest in UFOs. This interest was heightened during periods of political unrest, like the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Why? Did these federal agencies all believe that UFOs could be used to destabilize the balance of world power? Were they aware of something more significant with regards to the phenomenon? Unfortunately, documents released to the public do not give us much of a clue. We do know that some of the sightings classified as unidentified objects by Project Blue Book, the team set up to investigate UFOs between 1952 and 1969, were actually CIA spy planes. Did their desire to hide the existence of these spy planes from the American public justify their interest in UFOs? One thing is clear from the thousands of pages of release documents. The primary motivation of information agencies was not to undertake any serious research into the true nature of these UFOs. Well, many people say that the, uh, that the federal government, uh, the, uh, the American uh, CIA and the NSA and, and whatever intelligence organizations there are, and, and, and in Canada as well, uh, that these uh, various organizations um, are, are really uh, overtly display no interest whatsoever in the subject, but in fact have sort of uh, a secret concern with it and are interested in the subject, and that, that might very well be true. We have almost no evidence of this, however, and it and it's, it's, might be just sort of a triumph of, of hope over fact. But, um, but my guess is, is that they really don't care much about the subject at all. I think that, that, uh, that the Canadian government and the American government uh, gets its cues essentially in a subject like this from the scientific community. And the scientific community is resolutely hostile to the subject. And, there's, there's, and it's gotten worse with the scientific community. There's, there's very little uh, wiggle room, as they say. Uh, and so uh, in my own research on the subject, I have found no serious evidence of any kind of major studies going on uh, for any country, uh, at least in North America. In the United States, there was another agency that was often associated with UFOs, NASA. According to some authors, every space flight was accompanied by extraterrestrial vehicles. Obviously, NASA has been tight-lipped about these incidents. One such incident was filmed during the Space Shuttle Discovery's mission STS-48 in September 1991. The film was analyzed by University of Nebraska physics professor Jack Kasher. The Space Shuttle Discovery was flying near Australia at the time, and they had the television cameras on, and uh, it was looking out at the night sky because nothing interesting was going on. And suddenly there appeared a bright light on the right-hand side. There were a number of bright lights that were significant, but this was the most important. And it had started drifting slowly to the left, and it got to a certain point. Suddenly there were two quick flashes on the lower left-hand part of the screen, and apparently in reaction to that, the object shot back up very sharply to the right. And shortly after that, two streaks went through the picture. One right where it had been, or very close to that, and another over here. There was also a second object that had been drifting up. It reacted by moving off also. And there were some over on the right, and they reacted as well. So you had several objects, a double flash, reaction and then streaks going into where the objects have been. The, the NASA answer is a reasonable one because it does happen. They, they said that they were ice particles that were close to the shuttle and there are ice particles close to the shuttle frequently. And they said that the attitude adjuster rockets went off and the exhaust from those rockets then blew those ice particles away and that's what happened. That can happen. 
and to, and to someone just casually looking at the video, if that's all you do, then it probably seems like a reasonable explanation. I went far beyond that, though, because I took the video and I, I took the position locations as functions of time, and I made graphs and I made a very careful scientific study of how the objects reacted and how they moved in, in how the, the flashes would interact with that. And basically, bottom line, I developed what I consider five fairly significant and strong proofs that the objects could not have been ice particles. The film produced during mission STS-48 is not the only one of its kind in NASA archives. Countless numbers of strange objects have been filmed from the time of the Mercury program in the early 1960s to recent shuttle flights. In July 1969, the day before the first astronauts landed on the moon, the crew of Apollo 11 filmed two odd lights, which were later rationalized as reflections off the windows of the lunar excursion module. I can't say for sure that they were hiding information in this case. Uh, I do suspect that uh, NASA has been involved with UFOs, and uh, it really would seem reasonable to me that if they are involved with UFOs, that they would tend to cover it up. UFOs are very interesting objects, and it's not really a matter of whether the government is covering up UFO information. They are. It's a matter of court record that the government has documents that deal with UFOs, and they are classified. So there are those documents that exist, and so quite possibly NASA has some too. I cannot say for sure that they are specifically involved in the STS-48 as a cover-up, but I do have confidence in my study and I think that I can establish fairly well that these were actually spacecraft of some kind, not ice particles. I've spoken to many astronauts. The majority of them, I, I believe, have not in fact seen UFOs and they become distressed when a lot of reports have been attributed to them. But there certainly have been a number of unexplained reports. Um, for example, James McDivitt told me that he was puzzled by an object that he saw in one of the Gemini flights. And I've had letters from other astronauts saying they've been puzzled by, by certain things, some of which have been explained. Um, I think all the, the so-called smoking gun, I'm sh I don't know if you're familiar with the, the smoking gun, the shuttle footage, I'm totally unconvinced. I think that nearly all those pictures show ice crystals being blown away by the, the directional thrusters on, on the shuttle. That, that's my own opinion. So I think that's all nonsense about those things. If, if the idea that NASA would release all this stuff openly every day to the public is, is ridiculous if they were actual UFOs. They don't look like UFOs, they don't behave like UFOs, and they're not UFOs in, in, in my opinion. NASA has released a number of documents which, uh, in fact, I've published in, in Beyond Top Secret, which is the um, revised and updated edition of Above Top Secret, and I've published quite a lot of information also um, in Above Top Secret, my first book, which, which is now out of print. And quite clearly that indicates a serious involvement on the part of NASA. Um, NASA itself classifies a lot of information at confidential secret, top secret, and above top secret. Um, we know that. I know that from their physical security handbook. And I'm quite sure that a lot of material by NASA is being withheld. In Canada, the UFO matter was never really assigned to civil authorities as it was in the States. The only significant episode dates back to the early 1950s. Wilbert Smith, an engineer working for the Federal Department of Transport, undertook an initiative of his own with the support of his superiors to study all of the UFO reports collected by the Department of National Defense and Transport Canada. Smith was hoping to draw valuable scientific information from these reports. His study was known as Project Magnet. In 1950 uh, and 51 and in 1952, a Canadian a scientist and government official, Wilbert, Wilbert Smith, uh, with the Department of Transportation, uh, had a very, very strong interest in UFOs. And I think uh, what appears to be on his own initiative, did a tremendous amount of research on this topic, spoke to many American officials, including a defense scientist named Robert Sarbacher, uh, who told him that UFOs in, this, in the America were considered the highest matter of security. 
Wilbur Smith also became very close with Donald Kehoe, who organized NICAP several years later. Uh, Wilbur Smith was able to get approval uh, for something known as Project Magnet, which occurred in Canada. And this was a, um, a study that would, would attempt to measure the appearance of UFOs by setting up instrumentation that would detect them mag uh, through electromagnetic means. Um, it is believed, uh, in fact, I, the project did record a success uh, shortly before it was closed down in the early 1950s. Uh, it has been said that the project was going to be closed down anyway due to either lack of interest or a, a, an unwillingness on the part of the Canadian government to support the project. Uh, following Project Magnet, it is very similar in a sense to the closing of Project Blue Book in the United States, which was basically a policy of debunking and uh, shutting off of, of uh, good UFO information. Smith did not hide the fact that he believed the UFOs were interplanetary craft. So in anticipation of Smith's conclusions, the Department of Transport withdrew its support in 1954. He was told to cease all activities related to Project Magnet. Smith ended his study and submitted his conclusions. As expected, the engineer wrote that the phenomenon was definitely extraterrestrial in nature. Another study was being carried out at the same time by the Second Story Committee, a joint venture by the Department of Transport and DND. This committee's conclusions were far more conservative. After that, UFOs were relegated to no man's land. The Department of Transport didn't want anything more to do with the matter, and DND didn't see the point in collecting these reports. In 1967, the reports were turned over to the Ottawa Herzberg Institute, part of the National Research Council. But their primary interest in the reports had nothing to do with UFOs. The Herzberg Institute was the center uh, for uh, geophysical studies, in particular many astronomy studies. Uh, a number of individuals there, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Peter Millman, was studying um, how meteor observations can lead to the discovery of the meteorites themselves on the ground. To do that, he got the cooperation of the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, to uh, collect reports of unusual lights in the sky, reports of UFOs in some cases, um, and take the reports from the RCMP to the National Research uh, Council, which was uh, uh, the repository in the, the Hertzberg Institute. Uh, these reports were then examined to see if they were in fact um, re possible reports of a fireball or meteor that may have landed on the Earth for possible recovery by the geophysicists themselves, in which case it would be very important scientifically. If they were not uh, considered to be meteors, they were considered non-meteoric. And the Hertzberg Institute have, had a very small file every year of perhaps 20 to 30 cases of uh, reports from people who had seen unusual objects in the sky which were not meteors and were something else, something much more mysterious. You see, the National Research uh, Council itself was not interested in UFOs, but the possibility that UFO reports might lead to the recovery of meteorites. But in, to, in order to do so, they had to collect the, the case reports and the sighting reports themselves. So every year, the file accumulated larger and larger and was transferred at the end of each year to the National Archives of Canada. And these files of UFO reports uh, can be seen today uh, by anyone who wishes to do so uh, at the National Archives. Gathering of information is basically left up to the discretion of federal, provincial and municipal police forces. Whenever a complaint is filed by a Canadian citizen, a police officer is sent to investigate the matter. Most officers just smile to themselves when they find out that it's an alleged UFO sighting. To them, it just means more paperwork to be done, extra work for them to do, and they don't consider it much fun. They investigate the matter anyways, but only because they have to since a complaint was lodged. Of course, in the best of scenarios, the police officers would arrive at the scene and see the UFO still there, making them witnesses to the incident as well. This did in fact happen in St. Hyacinth five, six years ago. It also happened in Quebec City, in Cochrane, and in other 
other places. It has certainly happened a lot more often than we think, but they never tell us about it. On November 7, 1990, dozens of people, including local police officers and national RCMP agents, saw a bright object hovering over the Bonaventure Hotel in Montreal. The round object, which was surrounded by an amber light, stayed visible for hours before disappearing into a thick cloud covering. Two years later, Richard Haynes, a senior research scientist working with the Space Human Factors Office of the NASA Ames Research Center, produced a report concluding that the object was indeed a physical apparition and not simply a reflection or the aurora borealis. According to Haynes, the object was flying at an altitude of 3,500 to 9,000 feet. After analyzing a photo taken by a local journalist, Marcella Roche, as well as weather conditions at the time of the sighting, it was concluded that the unidentified flying object was approximately 1,783 feet across the length of five football fields. The incident is still unclassified. Several police officers witnessed the UFO over the Bonaventure Hotel. But do any special procedures exist for reporting this type of incident? If we talk about procedures in virtue of the objects that are not identified, it's not any different than any kind of event that we live in our daily life. As if it's not possible. If you're asking me whether we have specific procedures for reporting unidentified flying objects, then the answer is no. They are reported the same way as anything else that happens each day. If a person sees something suspicious in the sky, or something that has just landed on the ground or in the water, then we open a calling card and gather information. Our telecommunications agent then assigns a police vehicle to the case, and the vehicle is dispatched to investigate the incident. These officers are my eyes and ears. The men or women who check into the incident report back to me and the telecommunications agent that assigned the case. We depend on the skills and judgment of the officers who investigate the scene and prepare a preliminary report. They meet with witnesses and verify any evidence that is submitted. They then make a decision based on those elements. Their job is to gather and relay the facts, and then we decide what action to take based on those facts. Sometimes we send forensic specialists, or if it seems to be a case of a genuine UFO, we send support staff to secure the area or assist with the investigation. Obviously, in the event that the incident poses a threat to national security, police forces have mechanisms in place for passing on information. In the case of the UFO over the Bonaventure Hotel, the Air Force was called. Unfortunately, with nothing showing on their radar screens, officers at the Trenton military base in Ontario, who were responsible for the safety of Eastern Canada, did not feel that it was necessary to send up fighter jets. If they had done so, the incident may have turned out differently. If we see that a case is not well founded, we don't bother contacting the RCMP or the Canadian forces. They have a lot of better things to do with their time and so do we, for that matter. If a case is genuine, then yes, we have an agency, or rather, I should say an office called the Territory Surveillance Bureau. They are the ones with the official connection to the Canadian forces and the RCMP. If we see that there is something worth further investigation, a national security concern, then the Territory Surveillance Bureau goes into action. It advises the RCMP or the Canadian forces. Much to the disappointment of UFO followers, studying UFOs is neither the Army's job nor the job of the police. The Army's job is to protect the country, and the job of the police is to keep the peace. Most UFOs do not pose a threat. Ideally, to better understand the UFO phenomenon, we would need to set up a national civil agency, independent of any military structure, but having the same investigative privileges as police detectives, and whose primary objective would not be to protect Canadian territory, 
but rather to study UFOs. Utopia? No. An agency such as this does exist. It is the only one of its kind in the world, called CIPRA. La France s'est dotée d'un organisme within France's National Space Research Center, CNES. There is a civil agency dedicated to studying aerospace, since CNES's mission is to study satellites, rockets, and anything else that passes through France's aerospace. Les fusées et tout ce qui se passe dans l'environnement aérospatial. In 1977, when Minister Robert Galli was interviewed by a journalist regarding the strange apparition seen after the war, commonly referred to as UFOs, the minister admitted to the journalist that the French police force had received accounts of bizarre incidents and that they were planning on studying them, but more from a scientific point of view rather than a journalistic perspective or simply for media hype. Kness was tasked with setting up an agency for this purpose and it was given the name Japan. Japan was monitored by a scientific council. It was not just left on its own to study these matters. It was told that the scientific council had laid out a path for Japan so that it could gather information, analyze it, and formulate conclusions on what was behind this flying saucer phenomenon. Dès 1977, when Japan was created in 1977, Kness set up agreements and protocols with all civil and military agencies, defining the roles of each agency. The French police force and air force are responsible for collecting information, since pilots naturally observe objects in the sky as part of their job. Pilots report any strange sightings to the police, who pass the information on to us here at SEPRA. We then analyze the reports and offer our expert opinion on the matter. Et c'est nous ensuite qui euh, analysons et expertisons les témoignages qui, euh, qui sont recueillis. Donc depuis, euh, ce système fonctionne... The system has been working this way since 1977. Today, we have all of the information stored in a database. Every incident reported is entered into the computer. We now have a very large volume of information, with close to 6,000 reports. Rassembler l'ensemble des témoignages, euh, nous aurons à peu près euh, 6000 témoignages qui vont être euh, dans notre base de données, et ça nous permet euh, de. This will enable us to prepare an analysis of the sightings reported over the past 50 years or so. Depuis pratiquement 50 ans. The cooperation established between the agencies has allowed for vital exchanges of information. Permet de d'avoir des échanges tout à fait tout à fait intéressant puisque when we first set up this cooperative effort, procedures were put in place and each police officer knows what to do if an incident occurs. If it's simply a case of a person reporting something that they saw in the sky, a report is filled out and it ends there. The report is sent to our office a few weeks later. Un rapport est simplement constitué et ce rapport nous arrive nous arrive quelques semaines après. Mais lorsqu'il y a des des But when the incident is more complicated and difficult to understand, especially when there are physical elements to be examined, such as marks on the ground, then the police contact us directly, and we respond quickly with tools for analyzing these elements that the police and army do not have. The police and army do not carry out any actual investigations of the UFO phenomenon. They leave that up to the Kness. Euh, engagé par euh, l'armée ou la gendarmerie sur, euh, sur ces phénomènes. Non, ils se remettent totalement euh, au niveau du CNES euh, pour, euh, pour faire l'étude de ces manifestations. On January 8, 1981, in the French town of trans en provence a man working in his garden saw a bright, oval-shaped object come down from the sky and land on a field near his house. The object seemed to be made from some sort of polished metal 
and was about the size of a compact car. It didn't have any visible traits to help identify what type of aircraft it might be. The object remained on the ground for a few seconds, then silently took off and disappeared into the sky. At the scene of the incident, the witness noticed that the object had left a circular trace on the ground, approximately seven feet in diameter. He contacted the police, who then advised Jipan, as Sipra was known at the time. Analysis of the site revealed abnormalities in both the soil and the vegetation. No satisfactory explanation was ever given, and the incident remains unclassified. The most difficult part of the process is getting from the point where a person has seen something to an understanding of what has been seen. Information is lost along the way. From the time that the incident is first reported, to the time that an explanation is proposed. We have to try and come up with something that can be understood. What do these phenomena represent on a global scale? Of the cases reported since the 1950s, approximately 12% remain unexplained. What exactly does this 12% correspond to? It's a variety of phenomena with a particular set of physical and technologically advanced characteristics. It could be an object that zigzags across the sky. Or it, it could be a craft that moves silently and causes lights to flicker in a nearby car. It could be people who see strange forms near the ground which suddenly disappear into thin air. It's a whole slew of incidents that cannot be lumped in with known phenomena. On January 28, 1994, while flying at an altitude of approximately 39,000 feet, the crew of an Air France Airbus noticed a large red disc flying to the left of their aircraft, approximately 25 nautical miles away. The object remained visible for a few seconds, then changed shape and disappeared. Controllers at the Taverny Air Defense Operations Center, who were ensuring radar coverage of the area at the time, saw an unidentified radar blip on their screens, which was crossing the Airbus's path. Then it disappeared off their screens. As unusual as this may seem, this sighting by the Air France crew was not an isolated incident. Each year, agencies that ensure air transportation safety face incidents such as this. Most of these agencies are overseen by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. These inexplicable sightings rarely make the headlines. However, in a lot of these cases, the passenger safety has been compromised. On August 9, 1997, a Swiss Air Boeing 737 on its way from New York to Philadelphia barely missed colliding with an unidentified flying object. On January 6, 1995, a few minutes before touching down at Manchester Airport in England, a British Airways Boeing 737 almost collided with a bright triangular-shaped object. The UFO was moving silently and was undetected by radar. In August 1984, a Condair Airlines aircraft had to make an emergency landing at Ipswich Airport in England after hitting an unidentified flying object. British civil aviation inspectors reported that the aircraft had sustained major damage to one of its engines, a window, part of its fuselage, one of the ailerons and the hydraulic cables. In every one of these cases, no one was ever able to offer a rational explanation. Neither the civil aviation investigators nor Jean-Jacques Velasco of CEPRA. Alors, la position du CEPRA par rapport à ces cas inexpliqués est la suivante. Nous avons with regards to these unexplained cases, CEPRA's position is that we often see phenomena that do not correspond to any technology that we are aware exists today. If we don't have this technology, then it must come from somewhere else. And if it comes from somewhere else, then the only reasonable theory we can put forth 
is that it comes from outer space. This cannot be verified in itself because obviously we do not have the means to interpret these phenomena, but it's a theory that scientists can work with. In France, we have had a unique situation since 1977 when CNES created an agency dedicated to studying UFOs. It was created by Claude Poer, an engineer who is now retired. At the time, he was head of the Systems and Projects Division at CNES, and he became interested in the subject after reading the Condon Report and concluding that the subject must be interesting if you can write a thousand pages about it and then turn around and reject what was written. He then launched a series of investigations, which continued over time. In the early 80s, SEPRA took over from Japan, since CNES no longer considered the matter a priority. It had never really been a top priority. But in the 1980s, CNES became more interested in other issues. What I'm saying is that for some time now, we've had a group studying UFOs. This group has raised controversy over the years, since UFO researchers believe that they might be hiding the truth, just like the American government has been accused of hiding the truth about UFOs. The question is just how much can be done. I find it interesting that the French scientific community has undertaken such a task, because it requires an open dialogue between them and the public. In the first few years, a lot was accomplished by Claude Poer and Alain Estelle, the founders of Japan. Unfortunately, in the later years, SEPA was not able to keep up with demand, and it did not release much information. Its primary mission was to study phenomena in the atmosphere. De choses qui sont sorties du CEPRA, c'est-à-dire que le CEPRA avait pour mission d'étudier notamment les phénomènes de rentrée atmosphérique. They were also investigating UFOs, but they seemed to put a lot less time and effort into that side of their operations. Ils étaient aussi enquêtés, and there was no clear policy on follow-up of investigations. De temps, d'efforts, et il n'y avait pas un suivi, une politique de suivi très très très. Controversy sprang up between CEPRA and UFO researchers, who wanted to be the spokespersons on the subject since they were so familiar with it. But Poer and Alain Estelle would just give him the brush off, saying, no, we're working on it. Just wait and see what we're doing. We can't always be answering letters and phone calls. They're just too much to handle. This created a polarization between the two groups, and Sepra was suspected of hiding the truth. I don't think that Sepra has been hiding anything. They're just trying to do their jobs. The problem lies in the fact that scientists feel that UFOs aren't important. They have other things to do, while ufologists feel that UFOs are important and efforts should be focused solely on them. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. To add to the problems, CNES has never considered SEPRA a priority, so it has never provided the group with the means that it requires to do its job properly. The group still exists and is still carrying on its work, but at a slower pace. No reports have been produced since Japan became SEPRA. Progress doesn't seem to get past the discussion stage, as is the case for the 1981 Trans en Provence incident, in which a witness saw a spacecraft landing on the ground. The case was investigated by Japan and is still being discussed, but hardly any progress has been made since the original investigation. Since the end of World War II, several civil agencies have come face to face with UFOs. The number of unclassified cases keeps on growing. Even though a lot of information is still inaccessible, the thousands of pages of information released to the public over the past few years only go to prove that the phenomenon is a lot more significant than we were led to believe. Throughout the public and the media, skeptics and believers continue to debate the theory of visitors from outer space. Discussions might be more productive if we could study the facts without prejudice instead of simply judging a book by its cover. In the end, people will believe what they want to believe.